Then I will start emitting everyone. Eh? Yep. So we've got Basman and then Sanka and then me. Is that right, Ping Fu? Yep. Okay, good afternoon everyone from Thailand and good morning, good evening to um, everyone who joined us today, our young doctor, family doctor and our friends. It is a great pleasure for me to welcome you to the second webinar series of Working Parties and Spatial Interest Group Collaborative webinar series. Thank you to each and every one of you for being here with us today. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Basamon Mano, my people and family doctor from Thailand, member of the Rajakuma movement. On behalf of Wonka Young Doctor Movement and the Rajakuma movement, we are pleased to welcome you for this second webinar series of Fall in Older Person. And please welcome our translator, Dr. Brando Cancha, chair of Mexico Young Doctor Movement, who will translate us in Spanish, and Dr. Chloe Chan Lam, Hong Kong representative from Rajakuma Movement, who will be translate us in Mandarin. Our participants can click the button below and the global button um, to do um, for the language interpret interpretation for Spanish and Mandarin. Now moving along to our session, let me welcome you Dr. Shanga Randen Nikumara, Wong Kai Yang Doctor Movement representative to give us welcome speech. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, friend. Uh, dear colleagues uh, who have joined the webinar uh, from uh, all over the world, uh, welcome to the uh, second webinar uh, of the webinar series by the Wonka Young Doctors Movement in collaboration with the Wonka Working Parties and uh, Special Interest Groups. Uh, I'm grateful to uh, the Rajakumar movement, uh, especially to the to my uh, the chair, uh, Ping Fu, uh, my colleague, who was uh, instrumental in uh, uh, organizing this webinar on behalf of the Young Doctors Movement. So I also would like to uh, thank the Wonka SIG Special Interest Group in. Um, aging and health for uh, collaborating with us for this important webinar. Uh, I think uh, our objective was to uh, discuss uh, topics related to family medicine and which would be interesting to all our trainees and doctors and whoever uh, would like to learn about them. And I think this webinar itself is very important because of a few reasons. One is the world population is aging. The second reason is as family doctors, we have to manage a lot of uh, old people. And thirdly, falls in elderly is very, very common and we have to prevent that and we have to also uh, identify the causes for that. So for those three reasons, I think uh, this webinar, fall in all people is very, very important. So thank you very much again, uh, the Rajakumar movement for uh, joining in hands with all the other uh, young doctor movements around the world to organize this webinar and also the Wonka Working Party, sorry, SIG uh, in aging and health for uh, supporting us. And I welcome you all and I, 
think you would enjoy this webinar. Thank you very much, uh, Ping. Thank you, uh, Basma. Thank you so much, Dr. Shanka, for your welcome message and remark on following older person. Now I would like you to warmly welcome Dr. Professor Dr. Dimitri Pons to give us introductory speech. Dr. Professor Dr. Dimitri Pons is a professor in general practice, School of Medicine and Public Health, Faculty of Health, University of New England, Australia. Thank you very much, Dr. Basman. And uh, welcome everybody. It's uh, lovely to see so many people attending. And um, I'd also like to very much thank my colleagues from the special interest group in aging and health. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to invite any of you who are attending and who are interested in this important area to feel free to join the special interest group. And it is easy to do. Uh, you just go into the Wonka website, which you're probably familiar with, um, uh, but you can just uh, search for that on the net. Uh, it's globalfamilydoctor.com. And then you look at Wonka groups, right? And you will find the special interest groups there. And then you just uh, go down to uh, aging and health and click on that. And there's a an invitation to join our group. And you click on that and just put uh, some details about yourself. And that will come through to me as the convener of the group. So, so that's the way to do it. Um, but if you can't remember all that, it's a bit complicated at the beginning of the session, uh, just go into the Wonka website and it will be easy to work it out. So without any more ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Uh, all three speakers are members of our special interest group. And uh, so our first speaker uh, is Professor Sunia Sabsvari uh, from the Department of Family Medicine at Aga Khan University in Pakistan. So welcome, Sunia. Oh, I should, excuse me, I should say, if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. And uh, each speaker will answer some questions after their presentation. Okay, Sunia, welcome. Thank you so much, Timothy, and, and thank you to everyone for uh, joining on a Sunday um, and taking your time out. And I hope that uh, this webinar is useful for all of you. So, uh, Pink Fu, if you can uh, move to my objective slide, please. And the next one, thank you. Okay, so um, uh, by the end of the session, I hope that all participants are able to, number one, identify patients in that require a call assessment. Um, uh, understand some of the tools we'll be going through in this uh, session, and also then uh, know the causes uh, of falls and know how to uh, look at a multifactorial fall assessment. Next slide, please. So just a couple of slides as a, as a you know uh, intro introduction to falls. Uh, I think all of you who are here probably um, seen patients who've fallen. Falls are on the rise, and now they're the second leading cause of unintentional injuries and deaths in the world. In the world, and if you look at this, about eighty percent of fall deaths are now in LMICs, uh, and this is of concern for all of us who see patients um, who are now getting older and or older in the older age group. Uh, most falls occur at home and are largely ignored. And uh, we as physicians sometimes are also not good at assessing falls because we deal with the injury that the patient comes in with, but then we send them back home only for them to fall again because the fall itself is not at rest. Uh, next slide, please. So fall is one of the geriatric giants. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. It is multifactorial and it's a combination of aging physiology, pathologies, environment, and medications. And those are the things we will cover as we talk about fall assessment. Um, next slide, please. So the first question is, which patients should get a fall assessment? Uh, obviously, we are all uh, limited in our time uh, in our clinics. So we need to be strategic about which patients need to be assessed, and not everyone needs an assessment. The AGS and the BGS uh, 2011 fall guideline does recommend a multifactorial assessment for all older adults who've either fallen twice or more in the last year, 
who come to us with an acute fall or who talk about or complain of difficulty in walking and balance. All of these subsets of our older adults require a multifactorial assessment. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna start with the case. Um, and this is a 74 year old woman with hypertension and diabetes. She attends after falling in the bathroom and this is her second fall in the last eight months. She also reports a numbness in her feet, visual loss in one eye, and her daughter is concerned about her increasing forgetfulness. She takes multiple medications and we'll go through medications uh, in a little while. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this case. It's a very standard case that we see, and I'm sure all of you have encountered such patients. Now, how would you proceed in this situation? And the next few slides will help us with that. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Okay. So the first thing, in a patient who presents to you with a fall or presents to you after a fall, uh, in addition to our standard history that we take, our focus needs to be on how the patient fell, what were the circumstances around the fall? So what were the preceding circumstances? What was the patient doing before the patient fell? Um, were they trying to get out of bed, go to the bathroom? Were they just walking? Were they on stairs or navigating steps? Those are important questions to ask. Were there any prodromal symptoms? Did the patient stand up and feel lightheaded, for example? Did they have any uh, dizziness or vertigo or chest pain? So those are important questions to ask. What happened during the fall? Where did you fall? When did you fall? Was it in the middle of the night when you were slightly drowsy and trying to get to the bathroom? Was it in the kitchen, in the bathroom, outside of the home? Those are questions that are important to ask so that we can actually guide them uh, for, for um, precautions uh, after the fall to hopefully reduce the recurrence of a fall. And what is very important is downtime. So when you fell, so a patient who presents and says, well, I fell in the bathroom, were you able to get up on your own? Or how long was your downtime? Or were you, did you require someone else to come and pick you up or help you up? Those are important questions because they tell us an overall, give us an idea about the patient's frailty status, um, how much mus muscle weakness the patient has, or whether they are well enough uh, to be able to stand on their own after falling. And obviously we talk about injuries, um, whether it's any loss of consciousness, any broken bones or bruises, contusions, et cetera. Next slide. So when we look at causality of falls, this, uh, this pie chart tells you a very nice number. It's one third. All of these account for one third of falls. So medications, uh, obviously there's a lot of poly polypharmacy in this age group because of the patient factors, number of comorbids go up as we age, and the extrinsic factors are the environmental factors. And we'll cover each of these one by one. Next slide, please. So when we look at intrinsic factors, which are patient factors, some of these are non-modifiable. Of course, patient's age, prior falls, female, I mean, the gender, I mean, that's the, those are something that we know are there. What we need to look at is which of the modifiable ones can we make a change in? Can we do something about the orthostasis? Can we do something about uh, incontinence? Can we do something about their foot problems and maybe alter their, help them uh, with their footwear? Can we advise them to use a cane or a walker? And those are things we need to look at. If you look at this list on the right-hand column, however, what's important to see is that muscle weakness alone increases the risk of fall by 40. Hey, man. And huh? abdominal gait and mobility. Pardon increases falls by three times. Um, dementia, things like dementia increase our fall because our sense of the environmental cues may go down. Um, another question I'll leave for you to think about is how many of us look at feet uh, in non-diabetic patients? Uh, you know, we often don't do a foot examination if the first patient does not have diabetes. So those are questions we need to kind of think of and, and consider when you're evaluating a patient who's come with a fall. Uh, next slide, please. Indoor hazards and outdoor hazards. Of course, steps are a, a big hazard. Uh, it's not necessarily that we can change their living situation, but we can certainly advise them things like railing and, and how to hold on and climb up and down stairs to help them mitigate their uh, risk of falling. Um, uh, uneven pavements, slippery floors, poor lighting, uh, you know, poor lighting and slippery floors can certainly be addressed. Next slide, please. 
Medications. This is a big one. And I think of all the three things, uh, the three areas of uh, you know the causality bit, I think this is something that's particularly under our control as physicians. And when we look at medications, pretty much all cardiovascular medications, um, you know, ACE inhibitors, diuretics, um, medications that reduce heart rate, um, psychoactive medications, be it antidepressants, benzodiazepines, and even over-the-counter cough and cold medications sometimes can increase the risk of falls in, in this age group. And uh, a lot of uh, older patients take medications for pain management, uh, and alcohol, again, is another thing that we sometimes need to take into account in a patient who's falling. Next slide, please. So there are certain additional recommendations which cover um, things like visual acuity, functional assessment, uh, the activities of daily living, how independent the person is, uh, gives us a, a clue as to um, how robust they are versus how failed they are. And then use of adaptive equipment, mobility aids, um, becomes an important question to ask uh, in these patients. Fear of falling is very important. And sometimes patients will just elicit their fear of falling without even having to have fallen before. And that should prompt us to consider doing a multifactorial risk assessment in such patients. Next slide, please. So when we look at um, falls, these are the three organ systems that are really, really um, um, play a role in, in, in a person who's falling. So it's our CNS, CVS, and our musculoskeletal systems that we need to uh, focus on when we're examining such patients. So look for a person who complains of lightheadedness on standing. We need to look at orthostatic blood pressures, pulse rate and rhythm, easy enough to do um, CNS. We need to see if the patient has any acute confusion. Uh, is this patient delirious for any reason? Uh, is, does the patient have memory issues or dementia? Are there any focal neurologic deficits that led to the patient falling? Uh, is there poor vision? Is there peripheral neuropathy? And then musculoskeletal, maybe look at bones, joints, muscle weakness, uh, range of motion, which all play a role in, in this. So uh, these, this is, these are targeted exams, but they're really helpful in identifying all the factors that are playing a role in this patient falling. Next slide, please. So now we move on to the different tests uh, that are used um, to assess a mobility and balance and gait. And the most commonly uh, used and the, probably the one that you're most familiar with is the um, get up and go test. We'll cover that. We'll go through Rumbergs, SWPB, and the Tinetti. So this is a list of tests that we'll go through in this presentation. Next slide, please. So the time get up and go test is the one in which we time how the patient, if you look at the right-hand side column, how the patient rises from a chair, how he or she stands momentarily, how um, the person walks 10 feet, turns around and comes back and sits. Uh, what we want to do in this situation is that we really need to be focused on the patient's rise. If the patient is having difficulty rising from a chair, it is likely suggestive of muscle weakness, proximal muscle weakness, and then other illnesses like Parkinson's in which there is very kinesia may also uh, you know, increase their level of difficulty in rising. As the patient stands more momentarily, we need to see if the patient has any lightheadedness or does he or she sway when they stand or do they hold on to something when standing, which would suggest orthostasis. How they're walking, which will help unmask um, gates like Parkinsonian gait, patients who has an antalgic or painful gait, patient who has a wide based uh, ataxic gait, all of those gates can be unmasked in this. Uh, when the patient turns around, often peripheral neuropathy and cerebellar issues may play a role in their becoming unsteady and how they come back and sit down. Most individuals can do this in 10 seconds, up to 20 is acceptable. Um, and this is really one of the most dynamic tests to do. It doesn't require equipment. It doesn't require any special training and it can be done easily within an office room as well. Um, uh, the sensitivity of this test is about 70%. It is not very specific, but it's still one of the most recommended tests and suggested in most guidelines. Uh, uh, next slide, please. So a Rumbergs test, um, this is a test that uh, looks at um, stance and balance. And a common mistake that, that uh, I know my students and sometimes our residents make is that they don't have the patient get their feet together. It's very important to first align the feet together as much as they can, uh, you know, uh, as much as a patient can. And then just 
look straight ahead. They can extend their arms, which adds to the challenge of the test. Uh, look straight, keep their eyes open initially, see if they sway with their eyes open. And then if they sway with their eyes closed, that becomes a positive Romberg's test, which suggests peripheral neuropathy. Um, so next slide, please. This is a, you know, a short physical performance battery. As you can see, it's a battery of tests and it includes balance, it includes gait, and then includes a five pair stand. So rise and stand, rise and stand. And I want you to focus on the, um, on the five chair stand uh, because uh, on, uh, if you can go to the next slide, thank you. The next slide talks about, this is a large uh, uh, scale uh, study done in Boston longitudinal study that looked at the rise and it talked about if the if patient took more than 16.7 seconds to do the five um, chair um, stand, that in itself was an independent, independent predictor of falling and injurious falls. So positive fall history and a slow chair stand, both were associated with a almost 50% two-year cumulative incidence of falling. Um, and so this is the study concluded that the chair stand was a uh, significant uh, in these patients. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Tinetti is, uh, uh, again, a slightly longer test. It doesn't require special equipment, but it is a 16-item test that looks at balance and gait takes about 10, maybe 15 minutes to complete. And uh, it has a whole score in it um, and uh, less than 19 predicts um, a high risk of fall. What's important here to see is that this also has a sensitivity of about 70%. Uh, next slide. The Berg test is actually one of those which has the highest specificity. If you see on the right-hand side, again, it's a series of um, um, activities that the patient is asked to do, uh, you know, stand, balance, transfer, eyes open, closed, and retrieving objects, and also turning. So it, it, it makes the patient do all of these things. Again, if the score is less than 40, that requires intervention. Um, next slide. Thank you. This is, a, uh, this is a systematic review that was done in JAMA in 2021, I think. And it looked at, so it, it did the grade scoring and it identified, while it identified intervention as well, my focus here is on assessment. If you look at this, they talked about uh, looking at the various assessment tools and they said using any one assessment tool uh, is important when they're assessing someone who presents with a fall. Uh, they talked about uh, medication review, which was again given a grade 1A, which is the highest grade given. And then they talked about vision as well. So looking at vision as well uh, in terms of assessing um, a fall or doing a multifactorial assessment. Um, so now we go to the next slide, which sort of solves the case for you. So we, we see this woman, again, a very common, uh, commonly occurring uh, you know, presentation for all of us. Uh, that we'd start off with, you know, after we get her history of the fall uh, and get the details and circumstances of the fall, we look at this history and based on this history, we decide we need to look at her pulse and her blood pressure. Why? Because she is taking a beta blocker. Uh, she is taking two other antihypertensive agents, which can cause or uh, increase the risk of static hypotension. We must look at her visual equity because she is reporting visual loss in one eye. She does complain of numbness in the feet, so the peripheral neuropathy and the foot examination becomes important. We need to assess her functional status. Why? Because uh, there is a history of forgetfulness in this patient as well, as for her daughter. And a memory assessment is also warranted in this situation. Uh, and then any of the um, mobility or uh, tests or uh, balance tests that you choose, you prefer to use, can be done in this patient. There is, again, uh, when you look at literature, there is no preference of one over the other, other than the fact that the AGS, PGS suggests uh, TUG-T because of uh, the ease of use here. Uh, again, if you look at the medications, which like I said earlier, is really, really very important and the one that we can make a most impact in, is when we look at her medications, we need to think of, is the hydrochlorothiazide causing any electrolyte balance, for example? Is this patient having hyponatremia, which could be adding to the weakness and increasing her risk of fall? Is she bradycardic, which again could be one of the reasons for the patient's falling? Is she on, she's on glimepiride and uh, that is a long-acting sulfonylurea. Can that cause hypoglycemia in this patient? 
metformin is that associated with the B12 deficiency causing more um, peripheralopathy. And of course, the benzodiazepine, uh, again, very, very common uh, inappropriate list of inappropriate medications which can cause confusion, it can cause drowsiness, and it can definitely lead to a fall. And the atorvastatin, again, is it causing, is the dose high enough to talk about to cause muscle weakness? Um, here, I didn't deliberately mention the doses because I wanted to have this message as a take home for all of you. So we need to look at the dosages of all the medications in detail because just listing the medications and not looking at when the patient takes them and what doses uh, makes this an incomplete drug review. Uh, so I wanted that message sort of uh, there in the, in the presentation. Um, so if you can move to the next slide, please. So this is, uh, this is a just, uh, I want you to think about this. You don't necessarily have to answer me now. So this is a gentleman who's 69, has a history of coronary artery disease, who's had a left-sided CVA, now reports difficulty in walking and balance. He does not report a history of fall. How would you proceed in this case? Would you do everything the same way? Would you do anything differently? That's a take-home message. Uh, well, that's a, that's a take-home thing for you. Um, and, and, and what I would say here is that um, because the patient didn't fall, the only thing that, that you can exclude from this is doing a, doing a fall history because there is no fall history. Everything else would be exactly the same as you would because if you remember from the initial slides, AGS, PGS recommend that patients reporting a difficulty in walking also require a complete and comprehensive fall risk assessment. Um, so next slide which is my last slide. So there is no single tool of balance or um, gauge that is enough to assess such patients. We must make sure that whatever tool we use that has to be combined, combined with a relevant and focused history. Uh, we need to do um, a relevant focused examination, do a comprehensive drug review, and then perform a basic environmental assessment. And that sort of completes your assessment of a patient who presents to you with a fall. So um, thank you so much. And I'm going to hand over to Dimitri now. Thank you very much, Sania. That was uh, very comprehensive and interesting. And um, it makes me think that uh, certainly uh, in family practice, we could be using some of those tests a bit more. Um, I don't have any questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, does anyone want to put their hand up and uh, ask a question. Um, I don't see any hands up. It's always hard to break the ice with questions. Um, if, if I've missed someone, please feel free to just unmute and and ask something. Oh, all right. Well, in that case, we might move on. Oh, we do have, ah, we have uh, from uh, Sanka, we have a comment, uh, Sania, that the presentation is very clear and um, that's why you don't have any questions. So, um, so there we go. So that's good. We may have an opportunity for questions at the end too, if something occurs to someone. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, and we have a few other congratulations coming through. Thank you Thank very you. much for sending out. Thank you. So our next speaker is Dr. Mercy Nafula, who's head of the Directorate of Primary Health Care uh, in Embu County in Kenya. So uh, Mercy has a lot of uh, details on her CV there, but we discussed that in the interests of time. I would just uh, I just include that simple introduction. And Mercy, I think you're going to share screen yourself. So, uh, thanks, Mercy. Oh, yes, that's good. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, um, Dimitri, and thank you, Sania, for that uh, wonderful start to the presentations. I think it gives us a good base um, to move on forward to um, this presentation um, that will be looking at how we are going to prevent falls in all the adults by using uh, quality improvement and patient safety approaches. So 
Quality improvement has a very special place in public health and public health performance in that it helps in what we call continuous quality improvement so that we improve the quality of care that we're giving, not only at the community level, but also at the hospital or institutional level as well, because here we are also in, uh, including care homes. So it's important to do um, always have a QI approach because it helps you to use data for decision making and uh, managing changes and also creating a learning organization as well. So the model of improvement that I'm going to use in the presentation today um, is a simple model that is used by the Institute of Healthcare Improvement where it encourages, first of all, um, looking at uh, the three tenets of the model, which is what are we trying to accomplish? That is your aim. Um, how will you know that change is an improvement? That is, how will you measure that what you're doing is actually working? And then you come down to what change can be made that will result in an improvement, which comes into your intervention. And then you follow what you call the plan, do, study, act cycle, where you start small as you continue uh, making changes that will, um, that will lead to a better intervention for your patients, a better intervention for your community. And um, it also encourages the use of different kinds of measures, because most of the time you find that we use what is called either outcome measures, and um, or outputs rather than looking at the structure that you're using, the process and measuring the process, and then also balance measures like equity issues. For instance, if you're looking at um, maybe a community of all, older adults, what could be the balance measures there? One could be things like education, things like exposure to technology, things like which side of the community do they live in? So those are some of the balance measures that you can look at as well using the model of in, uh, in, uh, improvement. Coming down to our topic today, where it's on falls among older or, uh, adults or persons, what we are trying to accomplish is to prevent the falls. Uh, because as you can see, this is a huge public health concern and burden as well, because you can see one in four adults fall each year under the um, who are 65 uh, and older. And this is costing, this is um, uh, US-based statistics because most of the world, uh, we don't really have a statistic to show, to show the cost or the burden on the healthcare system. And you can see we lose 50 billion annually in terms of treating falls or uh, in terms of treating falls or treating the repercussions of falls and yet the uh, falls are actually quite preventable. So how will we know that a change is an improvement? So we need to do a baseline assessment and also a risk assessment and stratific stratification to know where we are. Because the problem we have with falls in older adults right now is we do not have the data. Even if you look maybe at your community where you practice and ask yourself, do I have data on how many older adults fall each year? Do I have data on how many of them are at risk of falling or data on any interventions that have been tried? And you will find that you have none. That's why this approach is very important, because apart from improving the quality of care, apart from mitigating risks that will cause older adults to fall, it will also give you data. And data is very important when it comes to the decision making and interventions. And in terms of measurement and tracking, once you have sat down and maybe you have decided, I want to look at the falls in older adults in, the, in my community, then you have to ask yourself, how am I going to measure this? How am I going to do the baseline assessment? And how am I going to do the risk assessment and stratification so that I know where I'm starting from? Then once I've put in place an intervention, what next? So in terms of measurement, some of the things that would be important for you to look at as you're doing the measurement is, for instance, the number of older adults you have in your community. So this refers to either the community that is for the family physicians who practice at the community level, then those at the institutional level as well and look at the data from uh, disaggregated by age, by sex, and any other characteristics that you think would be important that would give you a baseline of where you're starting from. Then also the number of adults who have had falls disaggregated by age, by fall type, by injury type, because this will also help you know where will I tailor my interventions. 
Then from there, you can look at the causes of falls in older adults in general, in your community, in your country, in your institution, because that will give you an idea of what has been happening in the past and what is most common. And where, for example, you can apply the 80-20 principle to see if I put an intervention in this one area, maybe decide to put maybe rails along the walls for them to support themselves while you're working in an institution or uh, addition of a ramp. So depending on the fall type and the cause, you can actually put one intervention that might actually prevent 80% of the falls as well. That's why it would also be good to look at what has been causing the falls previously. Then when it comes to the number of older adults at risk of falls, it's disaggregated by individual characteristics and risk type. I think this is where um, some of the tools that Sania has mentioned are very important. And even as you're doing your planning, if you realize, for example, you either don't have a comprehensive tool, this is where you might also decide that you want to come up with a tool that will be able to give you all this information so that you can collect that information as well. Then um, you might look at the intervention in terms of what interventions are currently in place to prevent falls and what interventions have been tried before and what type of intervention was it? Was it, was it at individual level, for instance? Was it at community level? Was it at institutional level? Was it for the, uh, on the patient, uh, patient side or on the provider side? Because you also uh, have to realize that even um, measures can also be taken on the provider side to ensure that the older adults do not fall. For instance, if you're living in a care home and you have maybe five or six classes per shift for maybe, um, 30 residents, you might decide maybe to increase the number of nurses so that you, you can have more vigilance over the older adults. And that is also a preventive measure. So looking at the time, the type and the location as well. And then from there, you have to decide how often will I now, once, once I've done my planning, and then once I go to my doing, how often will I be doing the analysis after two weeks, after three weeks, after one month, how often will I now be start collecting the data and how will I do the analysis and who will be doing the data collection and also the analysis in terms of the different areas that you want to measure. So uh, Samia had gone through some of this, so I'll not go through it, but it's good to always look at um, uh, risk factors in a more stratified manner, apart uh, the modifiable, potentially modifiable, non-modifiable, then in the modifiable, you have to look at them from a biological uh, point of view, from an environmental point of view, and um, also look at the different systems, the different uh, body systems and what risk factors they pose uh, to the older persons. Then also it's good to do a good medication um, analysis for the older adults as well, and also have it in your, in your risks uh, certification and assessment, because um, as Sania mentioned earlier, at this, uh, when, when uh, with older adults, you have a lot of polypharmacy, and that can put an older adult who is otherwise um, strong and does not have any muscular or any other physical disability, uh, they, it places them at risk of falls because maybe it causes some kind of somnolence or the, any other side effects associated with the drugs can cause them to be at risk of falls. So it's also good to include that in your assessment. So this is an example of um, how we used to do um, continuous assessment for older adults in Cuba, where I did my uh, residency in family medicine. So this is a scale, this is a geriatric, uh, uh, geriatric scale for functional evaluation. And what we used to do is every year, we had to do it for every single person over the age of 60. And then from there, we classify them according to what we call fragility or uh, fragilidad. So it depends on the scale of how fragile the older adult is, and it, is, it depends on the score. It is not only uh, based on one thing. It is based on how they score in terms of continency, mobility, equilibrium, vision, um, hearing, and also the use of medications. For example, any adult who uses more than three medications is classified as at risk. And then based on that risk certification, throughout the year, you have to do a certain number of visits for them, including home visits, to see um, um, uh, what their risk factors are environmentally, to see who they live with. Then the other thing we used to uh, classify them as a risk factor is any uh, person older than 60 years of age with um, 
any risk factor in any of these areas and also living by themselves would also be considered an older person at risk. So this is how now we were doing it annually and on a continuous basis so that we make sure we monitor all the older adults in our community throughout. So now coming down to you have done your planning, you are saying you want to prevent the falls in older adults, you have decided what you're going to measure and how you're going to measure it. So now after that, you need to go to your doing and your doing is once you have gotten the data that gives you your baseline, your risk stratification, you know how many older adults you have, how many of them have you assessed and how many of them would you like to assess. So it is always advisable when you're doing um, QI projects to start with a small group. So you might decide, uh, for example, if I'm in the community, um, just give me a minute, there's some noise in my environment. Let me just um, put on my headset, sorry. So um, once, once you have looked at your community, you might decide, for instance, let me start with the older adults that live in this home community or live in these addresses. And then now you bring them in, you do the risk assessments for all of them. After doing the risk assessments, based on the risk assessment certification and the causes that you have found, maybe you pick one cause and decide, for instance, I'm going to deal with falls related to sleeping, for example, in bathrooms. And then from there, now you decide these are the older adults I'm going to look at, and this is what I'm going to measure. And then I'm going to measure it maybe over a period of two months or three months and see if the intervention has, has worked. So now in the intervention stage is where we come to looking at patient safety and system level factors that affect safety. So you see at the core of system level factors, we have the patient characteristics, which you will do in the assessment. And then we also have the individual provider. So that could be you if you're practicing or some of your colleagues and how they take care of older persons. So what are some of the interventions that you can make at that level as well? Then you have to look at team factors, especially for um, uh, primary care uh, practices that have a team-based approach. And it is always uh, advisable to do a team-based approach. You have a nurse on your team, you have a family physician on your team, you have a physiotherapist on your team, maybe even an occupational therapist on your team as well, so that they can look at um, interventions in a more multidisciplinary, multifactorial way. Then also the work environment, if you're working in an institution, and then the home environment for the older adults. Then departmental factors, if you're doing a departmental approach, maybe from the Department of Aging or something like that. Then also look at the hospital and any other institution that you're looking at. So these are all the different levels at which you can decide to place your intervention, depending on the causes that you have found. And looking at patient safety, let's remember the biopsychosocial approach to everything. So the biopsychosocial approach to your patient and the biopsychosocial approach now bringing in other people, the community, the environment and everything that can affect your older adults and their health. So the most effective strategies are based on hazard identification and effective mitigation strategies, because studies have shown that once an older adult has even one fall, then that places them at risk of getting subsequent falls. So the best place you have to intervene is ensuring that the ones who have never had falls never have falls, and the ones who have had even at least one fall never have a second one because the more they fall, the more you increase their risk and the more falls they're likely to have. Um, then it is good to take also use uh, of a change management model for behavioral modification. Because as you look at some of the interventions, a lot of them are actually behavioral. So how do you walk through this with the older adults and ensure that they pick up your recommendations and modify any modifiable individual risk factors that they have? So some of the proposed strategies, and which I think some uh, Sania mentioned, are based on one exercise, particularly balance, um, strength, and gait. And some of the interventions that have been uh, effective in this is using Tai Chi, um, where in the community where I practiced and uh, I did my residency, we had uh, every day we had groups of older adults who would go into the park and also uh, and uh, practice Tai Chi every morning. 
to increase their movement and also uh, strengthen their muscles and also movement and, um, and, 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 and improve their gait as well. And this, I realize, help a lot of older adults because many of them, um, in, in fact, you'd find a whole year they have barely had any, they've not had any faults. We'd have like maybe one or two reports of falls within our community of, um, uh, we had 1500 people with about um, 600 older adults. So vitamin D supplementation with or without calcium has also been shown to be very helpful, especially for female patients, because you saw being female is a risk factor, especially with osteoporosis that comes after menopause. And um, so this, um, uh, um, I have seen it work even in the communities, uh, in the community where I did my residency. Then management of medication, we've talked about that, especially psychoactive medication, which may cause somnolence um, and, and other things that put the older adults at risk. Home environment modification, looking at things like loose carpets, slippery floors. If, for example, you have an older adult living at the top floor, can they come down and live maybe at the bottom floor? Is it a possibility? So modifying such like things. Uh, management of postural hypertension, vision problems, foot problems, and footwear, especially for postural hy hypertension, which is common as in older adults who take hypertensive medication. It's also common just um, as part of the aging process. So Having, for instance, if you're in a care home or in a hospital setting, ensuring that maybe each morning or evening they monitor the blood pressure of older adults that can actually help you with checking what time do they get that hypertension or when, what time does it begin to happen before an older adult rises from a sitting or lying position and then they get the hypertension and fall down. Um, so these um, interventions have been shown to be very effective at whether it's community, hospital-based, nursing home settings. And then another thing that um, I found um, very interesting and very important in terms of prevention of falls as an intervention is reimbursing it as part of the Medicare annual wellness visit. Because what we have, especially in countries where people have to pay for care and you have to reimburse either the primary care team or the individual provider for the services they've been given, if a wellness check as, or a fall prevention check is not reimbursed, then it's not going to be done. But if it is reimbursed, it is a very important move in to ensure that fall prevention and uh, risk uh, assessment is done as part of every older adult um, um, wellness visit or as, as part of their risk assessment. So um, I talked about the, uh, the use of now the change model, uh, change management model for fall prevention, and we normally have um, stages from the pre-contemplation stage to the maintenance stage. And the importance of knowing these stages is knowing um, where your patient is at and where you can intervene. So for instance, you have done a risk assessment for an older adult, then you have found that um, maybe they have a bit of muscle weakness and maybe they, should, they need to improve their gait and you decide an exercise like Tai Chi is good for you. So how do you start? So you start by talking to the patient and ascertaining what stage they are at. If, for example, they are still at the pre-contemplation stage, that means maybe a bit more education, a bit more support needs to be done for you to be able to get these adults to a place where they'll be able to do their exercises. So depending on what stage they are, you will have to do um, health education, you'll have to do support. And support can also mean bringing in um, the family and other uh, uh, support structures that they have so that they can help the older adult make that decision to come to a place where they accept the new behavior, which is maybe exercise. And then once they start doing the exercise, since you're doing measurement, then you start measuring from the time they start doing the exercise to maybe three months later or six months later, have they had any falls? Have they had also near misses? And then now you'd see that this intervention strategy is working at the individual level and we should maintain it, or maybe we should improve it, then now you start your PDSA cycle again. So this is for when you're doing it, you're doing the intervention at, a, at an individual level. So this is an example of um, a, 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 an assessment uh, by a care home who are doing a false prevention framework using quality improvement, that's the PDSA cycle. So you can see at their planning stage, they plan to meet their client needs in terms of false uh, prevention. So they did a false assessment, um, they, uh, they, they used a false assessment, risk assessment tool. 
um, they talked to the support staff, they came up with false prevention policies and procedures, and they came up also with a committee to uh, measure the change or to steer the change. Then when it came to now, how do we do it? They use this, you can, um, you can search the beach model um, where they use education, equipment, environment, activity. These are points where they were intervening clothing and footwear and health management modifications to drive behavior change. So this beach model is just a framework that shows you how you can intervene, where you, where, where, where you can intervene and then uh, different kinds of approaches that you can use. Then now from their, um, from their doing, now it is time to study. So the study part is where now they came to measure what it is that um, their change has achieved. So in terms of measuring, um, they did a false incident report later to see how many have fallen and types of false ETC, then false, indi uh, false indicators, they were also measuring that and other types of false reporting. So after you have done your intervention, you come back to do a review and see how well you have done. Then now you act. So you evaluate the intervention programs, continuing staff education and also accreditation in terms of being maybe a false free environment or a care environment or a care home that is um, that has the necessary um, things in place to uh, to prevent falls in older adults and this is something very um, interesting that i found as um, as I, I was preparing for today and it said united we stand divided they fall just to remind us that whatever approach we are taking in preventing falls in older adults it has to be multidisciplinary and multifactorial in terms of approach and assessment as well and with that, I finish and um, I think I can take some questions. Um, back to you, Dimitri, you are Ping Su. Thank you. Sorry, I, I forgot to unmute. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> ah, dear. Um, you'd think we would have learned by now after three years of pandemic, but anyway, <laughs> I'm unmuted now. So. Um, there's been quite interesting discussion on this very interesting presentation. Thanks, Mercy. Um, there, there's a few people who know about their data. Um, uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, Sanka tells us that a hospital-based study reported 24% of people over 65 years of age um, had fallen within a year. And um, Ping Fu tells us that the prevalence in Malaysia is around 14%. So um, it doesn't, but I, they are the only two that came up in response to a question. So I think you're right. We often don't know how many people are falling. Uh, and uh, there are some questions. Uh, one is um, a, a question about um, physical abuse as a as a as a background cause of falls have you have you got any thoughts about that screening for that how we should suspect it um certainly it's okay. a it's a problem amongst some of my patients um so um when I was doing my residency I did my um uh my thesis around um care of the older adults in the um, uh, the home setting, the community as well. And you are looking at it from a bioethical uh, perspective. And um, some of the questions um, you were asking um, were indirectly uh, related to abuse because there's one, um, how do you make your decision as an older adult, maybe about your medication? Do you know about your health and healthcare? So it is good to uh, do that assessment, but if you do it directly, you will never get an answer. But some of the indirect pointers that I found is one, an older adult telling you that every decision is made by the caregiver, that is one. Mm -hmm. um, two, we also ask the caregivers questions around like, um, for instance, if you ask an older adult to do something, for example, take this medication or do this, and they, um, how do you usually proceed? So when you mm -hmm. dug deeper, you'd actually find that apart from physical abuse, there was that um, other, um, um, how how um, how do I put it? Almost almost like emotional abuse, and it would come out through those questions. So I do agree, it is good to assess that, but the approach it should be not directly, just maybe find out um, the di power dynamics. 
if you look at the power dynamics between a caregiver and an older adult, it can point to that. Then, um, like I mentioned, like the best practice that I found in Cuba was doing that annual assessment for an adult. We not only do that evaluation, but we also do a physical evaluation. And that can also point out to one or two three things that is not um, that is not right. And then the third thing that you can do, and which I found best practice there, we always had to visit the older adults in their homes. So when you visit the home, maybe look at where the older adult is sleeping, what their bed looks like, where they spent most of their time sitting, you know, how many times they're turned over. So those are some of the pointers that you can also look at, which are also risks in themselves, because someone might not be necessarily hitting them directly, but the kind of environment that they've placed them in to care for them is placing them at risk. So it is not like directly abused, like I've hit you physically, but now I am doing it through the kind of environment that I've placed you in that is placing you at risk as well. So those are some of the ways that I've found that you can look at it as well. Thank you. That's very thorough response, Mercy, especially on, on um, a question that you didn't know was coming to you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, Mel, who uh, asked that question, wants to thank you uh, very much as well and, and thinks that maybe it's underreported. And I'll just put in a little plug that um, the... Uh, the Special Interest Group in Abuse and Violence has written to me today asking if we can do a joint webinar on abuse, uh, elder abuse. Uh, so that hopefully will be coming up next year. And that I think it would be important to do. And there, there's, um, there were a, a little bit of a discussion about, um, about the, uh, the thought that having the uh, country's primary care benefit package include falls assessment um, and uh, some some people don't have that some people do in my country it's listed a, among a long list of things that we should assess in about half an hour every year uh, so it's and it's not well it's not well taken up but I guess it's there at least so um there's certainly room for movement on that. Have you got any uh, comments on that uh, from your perspective? If there's um, any payment or proce process for making it routine? I think um, uh, one of the things that um, we are struggling to push in primary care, even in my country, is how do you, um, uh, how do you reimburse things like home-based visits? How do you uh, reimburse things like wellness checks? And I think in general, not even from the older mm -hmm. adults perspective, it is something that we need to push for because as we are pushing towards uh, health systems that are primary care based, then that means reimbursement has to be primary care based. So some of the approaches instead of maybe just saying for falls alone, you can decide and say a package should be there for all older adults to have at least one annual, you know, one annual check. And then when you get that at least put pushed through, then you can include things like false prevention and assessment and any other major things that are of importance for you in your country. Because I found sometimes pushing one thing um, can be detrimental in that you realize there's another thing that you want to do. And now you've pushed for only one thing and then now just reimbursing false prevention only or a wellness check. So it's better to push for a package, a wellness check package for older adults and then in that, include the things that are important for you. So interesting that prevention is underfunded when it could be such a powerful uh, lever for reducing costs and improving quality of life, isn't it? Thank you, Mercy. Are there any other questions for Mercy? You might have to yell out at me because I can't see everyone on the screen. No, well, that was very interesting. Thanks, Mercy. And I like the way it complemented um, the other presentations by being a systems-based approach. Um, yeah, so very good. Thank you. And I encourage everyone to think about quality improvement approaches. Okay, so our third and final speaker is um, Professor Nairi Kurse, who's the Joyce Cook Chair in Aging Well at um, 
the University of Auckland in New Zealand. And you can see the rest of uh, Nari's um, CV up there. So Nari, I think Ping Fu is, uh, you've asked Ping, Ping Fu, Fu to my slides. present yep. your, yay, thank yeah. you, Nari. Well, thank you very much, Timothy. And uh, I'm coming to you today from Adelaide, although I usually live in New Zealand. Uh, and I also want to thank Dimity for keeping us all involved in the special interest group and um, uh, also acknowledge Wonka as uh, a very important organiser for all of us. So the next slide, please. I thought I would talk about um, falls for very frail people and falls in residential care. And I uh, just noted a few things here which have already been covered that injury is indeed in the top uh, three causes of injury-related death for older people. And amongst our broad uh, whole populations, uh, important to think about special groups such as those with Parkinson's disease, any kind of dementia, but Lewy body dementia in particular. And I wanted to mention that injury is probably just the tip of the iceberg in the impact, thinking about the impact of falls, because of course, any fall in an older person can uh, increase their hesitancy to get out and about, and they will uh, correspondingly have a reduction in their overall function. This slide here just, talk, just shows that the unintentionary injury hospitalizations are much uh, more common in the older age groups are uh, looking at a per age per person uh, risk of ending up in hospital related to age. When you think about 30 people over 65, uh, about 80% of people in aged residential care will fall in any year. So the two populations are quite different. And when I was starting out in research in New Zealand, where everyone was very interested in the community, but there was not very much work in aged residential care trying to reduce falls. So I thought I'd tell you about a trial that I did. So the next slide, please. Um, so we took up, uh, so we were looking in residential care and we noticed that uh, there was huge variation in the risk of falling and in the actual occurrence of falls throughout the industry. And so we had 45 different units. We were doing a study about um, hip fracture use, actually. We asked them to report their falls, uh, I'm sorry, about hip protector use it was. And you can see here that the number of mean number of falls per person in these homes really varied by 10 times. And this was over the uh, 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 falls in each specific unit. So I was fascinated by that. Why on earth should that be? And I've been trying to unpick that for quite some time. So the next slide, please. So we did a for, uh, an intervention. It was a very straightforward intervention based on risk assessment. So I ran into this wonderful person, Meg Butler, who's a falls prevention researcher in the lift shortly after I'd come to Auckland. And um, she had been developing a lovely fall risk assessment, which involved uh, questions about whether they were on medications they shouldn't be, whether they had uh, additional functional limitations, whether they were incontinent. All of the risks were evidence-based and the nurse who was to do the risk assessment gave them so many points that if they were at a high risk, there were specific strategies that the staff were, they were recommended for the staff. So that included a high risk logo, which was to go on the bed beside, uh, on the wall beside the bed. We had education for the staff, which we went a couple of times to talk about falls prevention. The staff strategies also suggested that the GP should review the medications if there were too many medications and that they should get the person going with specific exercise. Now, I want to emphasize that this was a low intensity intervention. So you can see um, there was just a nice folder which included the risk assessment. One of the staff at the facility under, we undertook doing the assessments on each, on each resident. Um, and then they, would, they were to work with the staff to institute the suggestions. There was no additional resources. 
Um, and so the uh, if you just click one more time or to show that um, uh, Ping Fu, if you just give one more click, some more information will come up on the slide. So we increased falls by 34% with this very simple intervention. Now this is not supposed to happen, but if you look at the graph, if you've been pondering upon it, the blue line is actually the intervention group and the pink line is the control group. And you can see that after we started, which was in the March, April, the uh, falls increased in the intervention groups, homes compared to the um, control group homes. And it was a cluster randomized trial. So we were perplexed by that. I was so perplexed that I spent some time on my Harkness Fellowship actually working as a, a hospital aide in a volunteer situation like a participant observation. And I quickly realized that the staff are very busy and they have a high workload. The job is difficult. We were asking them to do a whole lot more things without actually giving them any more um, any more resources, no more staff, no more, no, no additional physios or anything like that. So this was an unsuccessful trial, which um, taught me a lot about falls prevention. Um, and so the next slide, please. The next slide talks about the Cochrane Review. So I was involved in this Cochrane Review and a Cochrane Review is a very, very detailed, uh, difficult review. It searches the, all of the literature. When this Cochrane Review group started, they had one uh, Cochrane Review for all falls prevention, but after quite soon after starting, they split this into a review of hospital and residential aged care and community. So I'll talk about the hospital and residential aged care review. And so there were initially 60 trials and in 2018, we updated it and found an additional 35 trials, so 95 trials. There's a lot of information. 71 of these were in care facilities and the remainder in acute hospitals. So let's go to the next slide. And you'll see, I think it's a for, uh, something called a, a forest plot. And you can see the line in the middle is uh, the line where it makes no difference. And each trial represents one line each. So if you look down and give it one more click, please ping Fu, you'll see the arrow points to my trial, which is on the wrong side of the line. So there I was on the wrong side of the line. This is not supposed to happen. Um, and I was very worried, but you can see that there's another trial on the wrong side of the line as well. And when I looked at this trial, it was 16 facilities and they had done a very similar intervention with a risk assessment alone and then suggestions with individualized strategies, but no additional support. So these two trials on the wrong side of the line mean that the summary continues to cross the line, which means that it's very difficult to identify exactly what strategies are very useful. The top first two trials there by Clemens Becker and, um, and a wonderful Dr. Dyer from Scandinavia, you can, say, you can see they are clearly on the correct side of the line where they reduced falls or the intervention result favored um, the intervention facilities. And both of those trials had considerable resources which they gave to the facilities. They had a whole physiotherapist uh, who joined the staff in the trials. They gave them extra nursing time to help with the strategies. And they focused on, uh, on, on physical exercise of the right kind. Okay, the next trial, next um, slide, please. So I wanted to talk about two specific, um, and so well, I wanted to talk about two specific uh, trials. They were both in actually in hospitals. The first was a successful trial by Anne Marie Hill, and this had looked at um, ways to to spend time with patients, educating them about the falls of risk, and it was done in a rehabilitation unit. So in New Zealand and Australia, we have sort of low level rehab where older people can go to recover and get specific rehabilitation. The length of time in hospital is longer um, and 
this trial was successful. So each patient got at least 45 minutes over two visits from a nurse. They also had some patient alerts, uh, alerted the patients to the risk of falls and raised their knowledge about falls. And they gave them videos to watch about falls prevention and a written workbook where they were to assess their own, their own, um, their own risk of falls. The staff were also trained about falls and patient behaviors. And the next slide shows the results and it was a step wedge design. And I talked to Anne-Marie Hill, if we could have the next slide, please, yes. And just do two more clicks and you'll see some red circles come up. Um, and this is where you compare this the, in a sequential way, how the, um, how the yes, that's the way, how the um, uh, homes that have had the intervention, you compare their fall rates with everybody else. So that first circle, the control group, home rate was 13.2, which was a, a rate per person year. And then the intervention had already reduced to 8.5. And as you see more homes coming into there, you can see that the intervention group rate went down to 7.7 .7 and 5.9. So that was a very successful trial in several and then eight hospital units across Australia. And the next slide, please, is about a trial that was not successful. Oh, there we go, 40% reduction in falls, but they didn't include as many of those with significant dementia. Now, this is an interesting trial where they had a very, very successful pilot study, which suggested that the six pack was gonna be fantastic. And the six pack included the placement of a falls alert sign by the patient's bed additional supervision. This was education of the staff and they also gave them extra people to sit by the bed to watch supervision of the patients while in the bathroom. They used the low, low beds, which are beds almost on the floor so that if you fall out, you don't hurt yourself. And then there were some simple staff strategies like making sure that the patient's walking aid was available and that uh, there was an establishment of a toileting routine or a routine so that the um, many of the falls happening in acute hospitals are around patients trying to go to bed, uh, trying to go to the toilet. So this was a very large trial around 16 hospital units with 46,000 people. The uptake was very good. They did lots of observational observations to make sure that the staff were doing what they would they should do but there was actually no impact on fall injuries. So you can see you can spend a lot of time and energy and still not have an impact. And I think the cautionary tale, both from my trial and from this trial, are that you really do need to understand the evidence base that you're working with and try to do things that, that can be very effective. So the next slide um, is the summary from the Cochrane Review and the things that they found to be very useful in care facilities was vitamin D. You understand that most people in care facilities are not outside very often and don't get the sunlight they need to make their own vitamin D. So vitamin D should be a mandatory prescription for everyone in aged residential care, except for those who have hyperparathyroidism. I think that's the only exclusion. Um, they also noticed that falls risk tools, such as the risk assessment used in my trial, probably didn't make very much difference in comparison to a nurse's judgment using her sensible clinical judgment. So spending a lot of time on risk assessment alone without focusing on actually the things you're going to do to change that risk, whether it be providing the exercise that would um, increase the lower leg strength and balance, whether it would be providing an occupational therapist to help with the environment, um, those kind of things were important. And in hospitals, multifactorial interventions may be useful, particularly if they're in the subacute setting, which is the rehab hospital, and they incorporated tailored patient education, so they thought that was important. I've got two more trials to tell you about. So the next slide, please. These were both successful and they were at the time after the Cochrane Review finished their um, searching. So um, a wonderful person called Hewitt, again in Australia, uh, 
prevent, presented this trial, which was attendant at a specific exercise class. And these exercise classes were called the Sunbeam class. And they went for one hour twice a week. And they did this for, um, I think, six months. And then after the six months, they had a maintenance program where they continued to do some exercise. They found that the physical performance increased and falls were reduced almost by 50, oh, by, by more than 50% in the intervention group. They also reduced um, uh, injuries. Now, if we could have the next slide, it, it has a little more detail about what this intervention was. It used some specific gym type equipment, which was designed specifically for older people. And so the resistance training that it produced could be increased in very small increments. You can imagine older people in the regular gym really struggling with even the three kilogram weights. These could go up by 100 gram increments. But it wasn't just that they used the um, exercise equipment. They had a physical therapist who instructed them in its use, who designed the, the program for them after a functional assessment. And then every, every week that they were doing their exercises, they were taken and, um, and with while well, they were off the equipment, they had specific balance exercises. So it was a whole picture. And one more click on that slide, please, Ping Fu. You can say they did, they did uh, usually were given 10 reps, which they had to do three times. And they did this for at least twice a week. It was physio led. Um, and they had a whole physio, one whole physio FTE for every five um, residents. So there was a lot of uh, in, in, in extra um, 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 resources going into the homes. And one more clip, one more slide, please. We've got this next trial, which was about nutrition. And it was a, a, a trial led by nutritionists. And um, they took them a long time to, to get this trial going, but they included 60 facilities with over 7,000 residents. And they randomized them to uh, food, more food or the same food. And the more food included dairy serves and protein intake. And they had an additional five serves of dairy a day. And they measured the amount of protein to make sure that they reached the minimum recommended amount of protein. Now, what this trial did in a very short time, within six months, they had reduced fractures. And over 12 months, they reduced um, fractures by 30% and 46% reduction in hip fractures. Interestingly, there was a small reduction in falls, um, but it was significant. And I wanted to say the food was donated by Fonterra, which is a dairy company from New Zealand. Um, and so um, it was important that that food was given to the homes at no charge to themselves or to the residents. The graphs that you see there just show the differentiation between the intervention and control group about all fractures and hip fractures and then falls in the lower, in the lower left. Interestingly, mortality was not impacted by this trial. Okay, so if we could have the last slide, please. Um, this second last slide. This just is to remind us about the interaction of the many risk factors. And so you can see the person and the intrinsic risk, risk factors there in the gray. We know quite a lot about that. Lower leg strength balance problems, having arthritis, having specific conditions like us having had a stroke, that we had a good talk about that. And then the place or the environment. So, um, you know, is there slippery floors? Is the person able to function well in their own environment? Is there enough light? But also remember the exposure. What exactly was that person doing when they were um, found to have fallen? Can we help educate patients? And can we help educate older people about falls and the risk for falls? I think that's quite important. And I'll share one funny story with you. My father, who was uh, in his 80s at this time, I went home to visit him and I said, Dad, what have you been up to? And he said, oh, Nairi, oh, well, I've managed to paint the roof. And I said, Dad, you're 80 something. What are you doing on the roof? And he said, now, Nairi, I knew you would be worried. So I tied myself to the chimney. 
And so I was immediately imagining him dangling off the edge of the roof on whatever he tied himself to the chimney with. But that would be perceived as a risky activity in anybody's books for an over 80 year old man. However, my father had been a farmer all his life and was used to doing very physically challenging things. And so he managed to paint his roof quite well. And just the last slide there, Ping Fu. Um, just in, in summary, there's clues to clinicians, which you've been given a very good overview of already. The blood pressure, the medication's very important. The gait assessment, thinking about the cognition and the conditions. But also remember after the fall, you need to give them time to recover and offer them some rehabilitation services such as physiotherapy or simply encouraging them gradually to get back to the usual activities. Now, or if you're the owner or a manager of a hospital or a home, please take care of how much food you feed the older people and make sure that they're getting an adequate amount of both protein and dairy foods. The exercises that people do are very important. They must be based on balance and Lower leg strengthening, Tai Chi is a very good example. In New Zealand, we have an Otago exercise program, which has a lot of sit to stands in it and a lot of simple balance stresses, which can be done in the own home. Remember home safety and then think very hard about the integrated system of your health system and how you can integrate some of the, these prevention activities into usual care. Okay, so I think that's my last slide. Just check for me, Ping Fu. Yes, thank you very much. So that's the end of my talk. And thank you very much for listening. I also just wanted to remind us all that those in the community who live in the community usually are quite a different group than those who are have very a lot of disability in aged residential care. And so exercise is the focus for the people in the community with lower leg strengthening, balance retraining, and the home assessment to make sure the home is safe. And for doctors and nurses and everybody else, make sure that the medications get reviewed and um, changes are made. So thank you very much for your time today. Over to you, Dimity. Right, Nairi, thank you very much. Um, there's a question uh, about whether, I'm not completely sure I understand Jayanthi's question, but I think he wants to know whether we should focus on people who have fallen already or uh, focus um, on risk assessment when we're thinking about falls prior okay, to so fall. remember, I think you're asking about those people who are already in the low rehab units the criteria the low rehab units in uh, some countries are specifically for older people so they're run by geriatricians and there they would do rehab after a stroke or they would do rehab after a period of deconditioning etc um, and so not all countries have those so the criteria to get in are that you have functional disabilities and that you need to recover so this intervention was done to everybody who was admitted to that low level rehab unit, no matter whether they had fallen before or not. And those people, and so the idea was to prevent them from falling. And that's because falls are very common in acute hospitals as well as aged residential care and in the community. So they were trying to put together strategies that would prevent the fall from happening. So that so all of the people who were admitted to the low level rehab unit had that strategy of having some education about falls, of watching the videos and trying to themselves understand and prevent the fall. And thank you, Nairi. And Mel has asked us about how to uh, advise or encourage older people to yes. do exercise. Um, and she did talk about behavioural models uh, as well. But have you got any thoughts on okay. that? Well, usually um, it, uh, instruction and telling them to exercise alone is not enough. Of course, the simplest thing is to do more walking, but actually they need to challenge their balance at the same time as walking. And so 
Uh, many countries will have community classes. So people who are exercise trainers will say, come to my class. They will gather together once a, once a week or twice a week where they will do the falls prevention exercises with an instructor. And this is kind of the best way, although it is expensive and difficult to organize, it's quite possible to train um, lay people or peers to deliver this kind of exercise. And then they can do it with their peers. For people who are very disabled, it's better to have somebody go to the home to um, do the exercise with the person and give specific instructions and leave, advi leave advice behind. So it's not a really easy answer to just go out and exercise. It's actually thinking about the exercise you need to do about being lower leg strengthening and balance retraining. And that is best done with an expert. Um, and then I take the point about the behavioral model concept um, from discussed before might be helpful. And yes, I think we can use some of those strategies to help people remember to exercise and then do their exercises. And that would be involved with some, some feedback to themselves to say, hey, you're doing a really good job. Look, my, my if I'm doing my own tests, look how many exercises I've done this, this week and um, potentially even some simple balance or, or strength crests to, to show when people are improving. No, I think it's, um, I think the exercise classes, if you can get people there, are wonderful in the community. I recently had a lady in her 70s who I've been talking to about classes forever. And she finally <laughs> yes. went along and she came in and said to me, you know, the people are really nice. I know I'm having a coffee now after the class with several <laughs> other classes. That's right. And she lives by herself. And this was actual social for her as well. It's really good. And so, I think that's um, a good feedback. That's a good feedback message too, that actually the classes are social and social activity is really important for older people to get together. It gets them out. And yes, even the cup of coffee could be with lots of milk and a bit of cheese. So they get their yes. uh, dairy well, products and protein. Huh? And there, Naomi, I was going to ask you because we have um, people from all over the world and about 60% of people from some countries can't uh, digest lactose. Ah. So what alternatives are you thinking might be useful? And then I'll move well, to that, Mercy's question. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure. I might, I might not be able to answer that, but certainly the protein uh, proteins in those countries are easily gotten from other foods. But it is a calcium, a calcium rich food that you should think about. So potentially someone could answer that what sort of calcium or bone health foods are available in countries where people can't digest the lactose. I don't Thanks, know the no. answer. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Mercy, you had a question, so I, I might get you to put that question um, to Nari uh, verbally, probably easier than me trying to understand it. Okay, I'm Mercy. Really, um, really a question. Um, you, you had put up a question asking um, why we think that um, when they educated the um, healthcare providers and didn't give them resources, um, the falls increased. Um, so it was just my attempt at answering what you had asked. <laughs> yes, no, I agree with you, Mercy. Wrong, you've got the wrong intervention, right problem, wrong intervention. You, it was a unidimensional approach. And I also think that that nurse probably was better off doing what she did before rather than filling in all those forms and being distracted away from the care that she was giving. So being very careful that you don't interfere with good practice when you do something as well, I think is really important. Good question, though. And I agree it's, with it's you. It's interesting about doing a study. I was part of a study to reduce pain in older adults in residential mm -hmm. care. And the intervention group showed increased pain levels, just mm -hmm. as your intervention group showed increased falls. But we decided that's because their pain was being assessed. Whereas right. in the control group, they weren't being asked about pain and no one was doing a, a pain scale. So it might have been a sign of success, if, 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 potentially. It, it's hard to know. Yes, we do have the and same I think maybe problem with falls. Well, they don't falls get reported. Don't get reported. 
And sometimes yeah. in a trial, you prompt the reporting of a lot more falls and it appears yeah. that those falls go up. So you have to be very yeah. careful to, to um, give the same kind of encouragement to report your falls to both the control group and the yes. intervention yeah. group. Yeah, yeah. So um, I have one more oh. question about balance exercises. And, uh, and also Sunea, um, who comes from a country where probably there is lactose intolerance, uh, it says green vegetables, rice and citrus fruits containing calcium. Thank you, Sunea. Thank you. Yay. We've got the panel working together well here. That's wonderful. Um, uh, so balance exercises. Are there any that you can suggest, Nari? Yes, I, yes, I can. So um, you, you must make sure the older person is safe. And so generally standing behind a chair or standing near a bench where they can grab quite easily. So simply standing with your feet um, right together uh, with no hands can be quite a balanced challenge. And then closing your eyes it accentuates that balance. And then with the eyes open, moving the feet so that one foot is slightly in front of the other or all the way in front of the other, which would be a tandem gait sort of, I don't know how you do it with your hands. Um, <laughs> maybe like that. So halfway yes. or all the way. Yes, that's right. So there's a tandem. <laughs> and then you can you can see you're reducing your uh, your base of support. And that's a balanced challenge in itself. And then doing that while uh, with, with support by hanging on and then without support. And once they can do that, they can begin to stand on one leg. And so standing on one leg is a very good balance, balance exercise. The second thing is to challenge your center of gravity. And you can see why Tai Chi is quite good for this because you're always leaning over like this or leaning over like this. And that while you've got a base of support that's reduced, begin a little bit of balance challenge. And that is stimulating your balance mechanisms to come to the party and keep you upright. Another, um, thank you, Nairi. Oh, no. We've got another comment from... Mercy about sardines, and I think the tiny oh, little sardines, bones in yes. the sardines are full of calcium. Yeah, yes. and you call it yeah. omena, omena, mercy. Yeah. Yes, call it omena <laughs> in a okay. in a local dialect here in Kenya. Yes, <laughs> that's lovely. That's and cool. Sunia, did you and have then... any other? Sorry, Nairi, go on. I, yeah. I was just going to respond to the question about the balance exercises. Um, so most exercises are recommended to be done twice a week, but actually balance exercises can be done every day and they'll work even better. They're not strenuous. Mm. So as often as you can is the answer to that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, uh, and, uh, you know, I usually advise patients to try and do them uh, barefoot. So they're also stimulating their, you know, the, the nerves to their feet as well while they're doing their balance exercises. Uh, so instead of wearing shoes and socks, um, you know, barefoot helps, I think, as well. That's good. This I, this panel is wonderful. I think we need to meet again and do, do this again sometime. Thank you very much, everyone. That was really, really good. Uh, Ping Fu, I think I need to hand back to you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Dimitri, Dr. Sunia, Dr. Mercy, and Dr. Nari for sharing your expertise, view, and valuable advice. And now we come to the final part. Please welcome Dr. Wong Ping Fu, Chair of the Rajamukma Movement, Family Medicine Specialist, Head of Clinic Ch Churas Baru Health Clinic, Ministry of Public Health Malaysia, for a closing remark. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Abbas. Uh, for the kind introduction. Um, I would like to, I, th I would say that it, it's a very good uh, full session that we had here. I do want to thank again uh, to the convener, uh, Prof. Dimitri, and together with the executive of the uh, uh, committee in the uh, SIG uh, on aging and health, uh, Prof. Uh, Nairi, uh, Prof. Zania, and Dr. Mercy, and also as well as to my, uh, to our you know, uh, YDN representative, uh, Dr. Sanka, I know he's a He's our boss you know, to the Wonka executive world. And also, I think I would like to thank everyone here, uh, especially to my friends uh, from other regions. I can see uh, the lead from uh, the chair from other regions, Dr. China is here, I think. I can, and, and also, uh, most important to two of, uh, you know, um, Dr. Brando, uh, the, um, um, yes, 
the YDN chair uh, from uh, Mexican and also uh, Dr. Uh, Chloe, uh, who have been uh, helping with me uh, in translating the uh, you know, uh, language for Spanish and for Chinese. Uh, because uh, you know, we do have a lot of our you know, young, young doctor boomer from other regions. Um, yeah. And also, I would like to thank all the uh, seniors and my professors. And also, um, I, I have very good senior like Dr. Chen. I think I've got a few more professors who have attended this purposely for, to support this. I think um, just to let everyone know that in Malaysia, we just uh, concluded our general election yesterday. So we have no, uh, yes. Um, yeah, we, we just pray and hope for the best for Malaysia. And uh, yeah, with that, I think I would like to uh, end my, uh, my, my op closing remarks. And just uh, to remind everyone that there will be another uh, YDM, the third YDM uh, webinar in collaboration with uh, Working Party and also the uh, uh, Special Interest Group of Onka uh, in January, uh, which will be hosted by the uh, Arazi movement. Okay, so basically we have seven, uh, would say seven regions, you know, uh, movement in seven regions. So uh, with that, I thank everyone again. Uh, but before we go, I think uh, Dr. Bas, uh, we will have a, a short announcement to make. Uh, I think we will have some uh, photography session. Yeah, yeah, okay. Let's capture our activity today. Could you please, everyone, open your camera and give us smiles for the photo shop. Pinful, could you please capture the photo? Okay. Sure. okay, okay, please, everyone, give us a smile. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll give another few seconds for you to. Uh, Yes, I can see uh, Loretta, so many people. I think my friends from Indonesia, uh, Dr. Uh, and also Malaysia, a lot of friends from Malaysia. Okay, just hang on. Uh, on the count of three, uh, one, two, three, smile. And then I would love you to keep smiling because uh, there are three pages here. Okay. Okay, one, two, three, smile. And then my strong man is uh, uh, Dr. Mel, very strong man of our region. Okay, another one more. Okay, one, two, three. We are a lot, we have a lot of GP from Malaysia, uh, Dr. Jayanti, Dr. Hafiza. Thank you. I think that's all. I uh, would like to share a, a feedback uh, link. Uh, no? So I think back to you, uh, Bas, you can conclude. Yeah, okay. Yeah, everyone, could you please give us your feedback so we can like develop and improve our webinar for the next sessions. And I would like to remind you that our webinar has been recorded and you will be able to reopen it later. Okay. And could you please kindly give us feedback here on the link? And I, we hope to see you again on the next session in the January. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Uh, Thank you. Bye.